Hello everyone, this is Shrimi. Welcome to the second video of my internalized ableism series. If you missed the first video in this series, then it is available through the link in the description and it talks about the self-doubt that disabled people experience, such as worrying about faking your disability or just looking for sympathy. Today we will be looking at self-neglect. It kind of comes in two flavors. One is just beating yourself up and or just not taking care of yourself as well as you should. But the other part is more about not wanting to disappoint other people and always putting others before yourself and putting other people's needs, very likely non-disabled people's needs over your own needs. So the orangey things highlight the things that you do to yourself and the greenish things highlight basically just being a doormat for non-disabled people <laughs> and not making your needs known because Sometimes it's because you're worried that they won't take it seriously, and that can really hurt. So sometimes it's easier to just not ask, and sometimes it's just internalized ableism, just holding yourself to a very high standard, which isn't always bad, but it can be harmful. So let's talk about the kind of self-neglect that you inflict on yourself, without necessarily other people involved. There's things you can tell yourself, like, other people have it worse. Oh, this is normal, it's fine. I'm sure it's nothing. Today is just an off day. Actually, they're faking it and I'm just trying to get sympathy. And actually, probably most of this bingo applies to this. But essentially, you're kind of invalidating yourself and your own struggles and kind of just dismissing them as not important. And that can lead to basically just refusing to get help even when it's available or refusing to try and improve your life because you don't want to believe that you have a problem. And honestly, the number of people I know who are like that, totally not throwing shade on some of my friends, but also seriously guys and gals and non-binary pals, like what? Although I'm not really one to talk because I used to be exactly like that. And that was because when I was young, I had a really bad experience with mental health professionals in particular. And in general with doctors, I just didn't have very good ones. And some of them were actively harmful instead of helpful. So it's understandable that I don't want to see them. But I think for a lot of people, they're just kind of hoping that it will go away. Or they're waiting for it to get worse until they get help. And that's a terrible idea because it might get so bad that you won't even be able to get yourself to the doctor's office. And it can, you know, conditions can deteriorate and become more difficult to treat. So it's always better, I think, to go. And actually, at the intersection of these two things, other people and self, for me, is the bit that says new symptoms, not going to the doctors. And yeah, this is kind of a struggle for me because I get really self-conscious and I start feeling bad for like wasting the doctor's time in case I'm just faking or if it's not such a big deal because, you know, most of the time you have some sort of symptom and you look it up on Google, it's like, it's cancer. So you don't want to be that person in the doctor's office. And for me, I feel like I am sometimes that person because I get like health anxiety and I do have a lot of weird symptoms that kind of went untreated for ages. And I must say that it's hard work to take care of your health and to see doctors and stuff. Like for me, I have to do it a lot. And sometimes you just don't have the energy to make those appointments and to talk to them. And you know, sometimes people are embarrassed to talk about certain things, which is also something that I've been trying really hard to get over because that was a huge issue for me. I'm getting better at it and I'm trying to, you know, take control of my own health, but it's hard and it's scary. And that's the level of vulnerability there when you have to talk to someone about your problems. Lots of people don't want to do that, and they would literally rather suffer than force themselves to do it. Or sometimes it's like the unknown, because when you try to start recovering from something, it's scary because you don't know what that road is going to look like, while at least your current situation, it's familiar. I'm mostly talking from the perspective of someone with mental health problems and 
someone who just kind of had to figure it out independently. I didn't have anyone to help me or support me through that, or except from like friends. But family-wise, when I was growing up and I was having all these problems, kind of had to find my own way through them. Anyways, basically my point is, I see that a lot, that people just start neglecting their needs for whatever reason, and maybe it's because our society has this like cult of selflessness and just taking care of yourself is seen as selfish, but I promise you it's not. And actually, if you are a huge SJW like I am, it might make you think. It made me think when I saw this and it just called this out as internalized ableism because that's literally what it is. So I hope this is food for thought for some people. <laughs> totally not throwing shade. Okay, maybe a little bit. Cool. <laughs> and then the second aspect of self-neglect is when you do it in order to comfort other people because you don't want to inconvenience other people. You don't want to take resources from someone who quote-unquote really needs it. You do things like not mentioning that something is bad for you or really struggle to set boundaries. And you basically just agree to literally everything and anything that people want from you. And I have a lot of experience with that. Unfortunately, I learned why you shouldn't do that the hard way. So when I was at university, I was very active. I just wanted to do everything and do it really well. I didn't want to miss out on anything. So I was in lots of societies and I was also on society committees. I did things like write articles for a student magazine, draw illustrations for it. I started my own society, which was Neurodiversity and Disability Society, which is my baby. Makes me really happy. I did all of that, and then at the same time, I also tried to work on my game and put out new art. And at the same time, obviously I had also my degree, which is biology. So it's like a pretty intense science degree requiring lots of self-study and lots of research. And then, because I'm not very well off and because I'm from the EU in the UK, I didn't get the same type of funding that UK students get. So I was also constantly worrying about money and tried to find a part-time job. And then got really upset when I couldn't do that. And when it came to my degree, I wanted to be perfect, like I wanted to get a first in everything because it's biology and biology is like my thing. Like when I was at school, I was the best in my class in it. Not that it was a particularly high bar, but still, I was like the biologist. But at uni, everyone was the biologist. And so I felt really inferior to everyone. <laughs> and I wanted to compensate that by working really hard. Point is, I did all those things because I wanted to. But in doing that, I just completely neglected to think about my limits. Because I didn't want to have any limits. So I pushed myself, I decided that that's how I want to live my life. That I want to take everything from it. And I don't want to miss out on things. Unfortunately, towards the end of my degree that caught up with me, I was just so incredibly stressed. And because I was doing so much volunteering, people knew me and they knew that I do a lot of things. So they asked me for more things. And then at some point I just started failing and I couldn't do the things that people asked me to do. And then obviously I would feel really bad. And because I didn't properly communicate that I was not feeling well or that I was too busy with other stuff, I just ended up disappointing people. And then that made me really anxious all the time. Basically it was a mess. When I finally graduated, everything just kind of stopped very abruptly. So the combination of being really tired and burnt out with the disruption to my normal lifestyle, I just completely crashed and I was so depressed that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even like get out of bed and it was just such an awful time. It's been two years now and I feel like I'm still recovering from that. I was reminded of this because one of my social networks was like, here's a thing you posted two years ago, and this is the thing that I drew at the time. So the first panel is how I say it. Oh, you know, I'm a bit busy today, so I'm not sure if I can do it. 
but I have no plans for the day whatsoever so it's unconvincing because I literally stay inside all day. Reality. Please stop asking me to do stuff, I can't right now because I can't but I'm super bad at saying no to people so please just leave me alone. That is pretty much how I felt then. I don't know how else to communicate to people to give me a break since I'm unable to say no to things. So that was the only way I could express myself at the time. Right now I'm trying really hard to set those boundaries because now I've learned what happens to me if I don't. I might be different from a lot of disabled people in that I can push myself to do the things that are hard, but the problem is that I will pay for it in the future. Another example that I think is valuable is how I used to be about uni things and job things in regards to my disability. Essentially, I was really worried about disclosing it because I don't want people to discriminate against me. And even though it's prohibited by law, you don't know whether that will happen in regards to like job interviews and stuff because it's not like they're going to tell you, oh, we decided to not hire you because you're autistic. I mean, it's not like employers even have to tell you why they decided to not hire you, so like, the law can say anything. Doesn't mean people are going to follow it, because people still have unconscious biases. Because it's invisible, being autistic and ADHD and stuff, and having mental health problems, it's possible to hide it if you mask well enough. So I didn't want to discuss it. But the problem is that I kind of have to because a lot of situations that other people find completely normal are just not accessible to me. For instance, a lot of people dislike formal job interviews, but I actually strongly prefer them to so-called informal ones because the few times that I applied for jobs and the interviewers tried to be informal, they invited me to have the interview in a coffee shop. Jolly good, right? No. I absolutely cannot concentrate in a coffee shop because there's so many other people and there's always like background noise and I have auditory processing problems that mean that my brain doesn't filter all the noise so everything goes on at the same time and it's really distressing to me. Like even when it comes to just going out I can barely tolerate it. Which is a big problem because it means that just lots of social situations are really hard for me and are really draining much more than they are for most people. But because I don't want to disclose my disability and inconvenience the person, but mostly just didn't want them to know, I would try to just get over it and do it anyway. But ironically, the resulting situation actually inconvenienced them much more than if I had told them in advance that I need to be in a quiet room with them by ourselves. Because we would get there, to the cafe, then we would be in there for like 30 seconds. Because I'm already anxious, because I'm having an interview, I would get instantly overstimulated and unable to do the interview. Then we would have to urgently go somewhere else and find a quieter place. And then this whole disruption to the interview process would probably make me less effective at talking about the thing I want to talk about and also probably really annoy them. And inconvenience them more than if I had just... Yeah. So, that's a big part of the reason why I have started just disclosing autism first and then ADHD, because I found that not doing it had worse consequences than doing it. And, you know, if they're going to be about it, then do I really want to work with them? I mean, I am kind of desperate for a proper job, but still. The reality is that it's not possible to just ignore my disability. If I do ignore it, then sooner or later that will catch up and bite me in the butt. So that's another good reason to not do that to yourself. And that's the reason why I stopped doing it and started stating my boundaries, stating my limits and asking people to accommodate me. I feel like that makes lots of people not like me or just not want to bother with me because I'm so difficult to plan around apparently and I'm, I'm just tired of that I just want people to be decent to me is that too much to ask obviously there's always some degree of compromise that you have to do that's 
you know, very understandable. Um, and I've been accused by some people in, like, not willing to agree to compromises, but it was over things like when you hang out in a group of people and there's just, like, people, like, yelling at each other instead of talking like normal people. And, like, I don't know, playing loud music, and just generally being rowdy and having, like, bright lights. And for me, as an autistic person, it's just really isolating because I'm so sensitive to sensory input and there's just only so much of that I can take and I have to say that it makes me feel super isolated from other people. I just feel excluded from so many social situations because people are not willing to make them accessible to me. And sometimes the only way to be included is to just smile through the pain because people find it really difficult for some reason. Or I guess people can have opposite needs, so for example, if I'm watching a film on someone or with a group of people, I need it to be quieter because everything is too loud for my brain. And someone else might be hard of hearing, so they might need it to be louder. Although we would have a common need, which is subtitles, because I have auditory processing problems and so sometimes when I listen to speech it just sounds like gibberish. And a deaf person or hard of hearing person would have trouble hearing, so we share that. And you know, I try to do things like wear earplugs, wear sunglasses. Okay, I don't, I don't own sunglasses, but for outside things I have glasses that turn into sunglasses. But point being, I try, but sometimes the only way that I can accommodate myself is just to leave. And it feels like people could do a lot more to accommodate disabilities and they just don't want to because it's effort. So that's why we end up doing this. And the thing is that in order to confront this problem, you really have to confront other people around you. And that's really difficult. Stating what your boundaries are and what you need and hoping that they will be understanding. Yeah, it's a struggle. I don't really see any other solution other than, than actually getting over the shame and prioritizing your well-being and trying to make it get through to others. That's really hard. But I've started doing that and I feel like it has improved my life a lot. So I recommend trying it. I hope you have found this video helpful. Let me know in the comments if you have experienced self-neglect and how you deal with it. You can subscribe to my channel for more videos using art to discuss all kinds of topics such as disability, social justice, LGBT issues and more. Thank you very much for watching. This was Shroomy and I hope to see you again. Bye-bye! Also, this drawing took me a ridiculously long time, mainly because of the wheelchair, but shout out to my friend Amy who gave me a very good reference of her and her wheelchair. Thank you. But yeah, Procreate says 11 hours 14 minutes is how long I drew this for. So I hope you can appreciate that. I did it for you.